Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a very slightly ill sounding start on my review of Imperial Earth by Arthur C. Clarke. So, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. 2276, and Duncan Mackenzie is about to leave his native Titan for celebrations to be held on Mother Earth. But Duncan has more on his mind than festivities. He has a delicate mission to perform for himself, his family, and the future of his home planet. So let's go through and check out some tabs. I mean, one thing that kind of caught my eye in, in the um, right at the beginning: dedication here for a lost friend. And then there's a quote from Ernest Hemingway: "Remember them as they were and write them off." Bit, bit harsh, isn't it? Oh, and this is a couple Malcolm and Ellen, and they have a child, and um, the child is not very. He's not born very well. Um, so we get here. Mm. Even as a baby, Anitra was beautiful, and it was confident, and it was confidentially predicted that when she grew up, she would be completely spoiled. I think it's meant to be confidently. I'm not sure. Needless to say, there were as yet no child psychologists on Titan, so no one noticed that the little girl was too docile, too well behaved and too silent. Not until she was almost four years old did Malcolm and Alan finally accept the fact that Anitra would never be able to speak and that there was no one really at home in the lovely shell their bodies had fashioned. The fault lay in Malcolm's genes, not Ellen's. Sometime during his shuttling back and forth between Earth and Mars, a stray photon that had been cruising through space since the cosmic dawn had blasted his hopes for the future. The damage was irreparable, as Malcolm discovered when he consulted the best genetic surgeons of four worlds. It was a chilling thought that he had actually been lucky with Anitra. The results could have been far, far worse. So in the end, he ends up having a clone of himself made, as you do. So, um, yeah, Duncan. Is it Duncan? Yeah, he's heading off to Earth. He's never been to Earth before. Um, so we find Earth's gravity is five times Titan's. It's impossible, he said gloomily. I'll never be able to walk on Earth. Well, I did, though it wasn't easy at first. Do everything the doctors tell you, even if it sounds silly. Spend all the time you can in baths or lying down. Don't be ashamed to use wheelchairs or prosthetic devices, at least for the first couple of weeks. And never try to run. Run? Sooner or later you'll forget you're on Earth and then you'll break a leg. And here we get some more of the differences between Titan and Earth. If a Terran wants a fire, he ignites a jet of hydrocarbons and lets it burn. We do exactly the opposite. We set fire to a jet of oxygen and let it burn in our hydromethane atmosphere. So a couple of interesting uh, paragraphs here, which I think tell a lot about human psychology. The problems of keeping 500 young adults entertained and out of mischief on a six months cruise aboard even the largest space liner had not been given sufficient thought. The law professor who had signed on as Master at Arms was later heard to complain bitterly about the complete absence from the ship's inventory of hypodermic guns and knockout gas. On the other hand, there had been no deaths or serious injuries, only one small pregnancy, and everyone had learned a great deal, though not necessarily in the areas that the organisers intended. The first few weeks, for example, were mostly occupied by experiments in zero-gravity sex, despite warnings that this was an expensive addiction for those compelled to spend most of their lives on planetary surfaces. Other shipboard activities, it was widely believed, were not quite so harmless. There were reports of tobacco smoking, not actually illegal of course, but hardly sensible behaviour when there were so many safe alternatives. Uh, even more alarming were persistent rumours that someone had smuggled an emotion amplifier on board Mentor. The so-called joy machines were banned on all planets, except under strict medical control. But there would always be people for whom reality was not good enough. And, uh, and this is just interesting about like some references to how, in, in this book at least, uh, the world coped with overpopulation. Thus the supposedly unshockable Terrans were genuinely horrified at encountering families with three and even four children on Titan. The 20th century's millions of skeleton babies still haunted the conscience of the world, and such tragic but understandable excesses as the breeder lynching campaign, not to mention the burning of the Vatican, had left permanent scars on the human psyche. Duncan could still remember Kalindi's expression when she encountered her first family of six. Outrage contended with curiosity until both were moderated by Terran good manners. He had patiently explained the facts of life to to her, pointing out that there was nothing externally sacred about the dogma of zero growth, and that Titan really needed to double its population every 50 years. Eventually she had appreciated this logically, but she had never been able to accept it emotionally, and it was emotion that provided the driving force of Kalindi's life. Her will and beauty and intelligence were merely its servants. So I want to read out a couple of paragraphs here, because this talks about... I think it, it, captures, it captures how like time dilation and the huge uh, distances involved in space travel make communication difficult. But what's also cool is it kind of re it, it shows how when mankind progresses beyond Earth and these huge distances are involved, how that will affect communication in, in a similar way to how 
um, communication used to be before the advent of telephones and the internet and all of that stuff where it would take months to get messages from one group of people to another. Uh, it lay only three seconds away, yeah, that was enough. He had travelled a mere million kilometres in less than half a day, but the sense of separation was already almost complete. It was intolerable to wait six seconds for every reaction and every answer. By the time a reply came, he had forgotten the original question and had started to say something else. And so the attempted conversation had quickly degenerated into a series of stops and starts, while he and Marissa had stared at each other in dumb misery, each waiting for the other to speak. He was glad that the ordeal was over. The experience brought home to him, as nothing else had yet done, the sheer immensity of space. The solar system, he began to suspect, was not designed for the convenience of man, and that presumptuous creature's attempts to use it for his own advantage would often be foiled by laws beyond his control. All his life, Duncan assumed, assumed without question that he could speak to friends or family instantly, wherever he might be. Yet now, before he had even passed Saturn's outer moons, that power had been taken away from him. For the next 20 days he would share a lonely, isolated bubble of humanity, able to interact with his fellow passengers, but cut off from all real contact with the rest of mankind. And another kind of parallel there, they're talking about steam engines. Um, they took really long journeys, even on Earth, which took weeks, just like space travel. Someone says, I see, in those days the countries on Earth were almost as far apart as the planet. And we get some references to like Hemingway and Kipling and things like that. We get the line, um, the sincerity of a speech of thanks is often inversely proportional to its length, so short speeches of thanks are generally the most heartfelt. And uh, back on board the Sirius, uh, it was the only chance most of them would have, ever have of experiencing weightlessness long enough to enjoy it. What a crime to waste the opportunity. No wonder that the most popular item in the ship's library the last few days had been the NASA Sutra, an old book and an old joke. It explained so often that it was no longer funny. We get a reference to there now of being 95 American presidents, which helps us to kind of, I guess, visualise when this is set as well. And this is interesting, we get, uh, I hope all those other cars are on automatic, he said anxiously. Of course, Washington said. It's been a criminal offence for, oh, at least 100 years to drive manually on a public highway. Though we still have occasional psychopaths who kill themselves and other people. And that's really interesting to me because I've, I've seen that speculated, especially more recently, um, that the rise of self-driving cars will eventually mean that driving manually will be illegal because self-driving cars will become so much safer. And I thought this was cool. We learn here about how presidents are elected in this time. Uh, as a gesture of courtesy, in this centennial year, she was not only President of the United States, but also of Earth. And of course, she had not asked for either job. If she had done so, or even if she'd been suspected of such a faux pas, she would have been automatically eliminated. For the last century, almost all top political appointments on Terra had been made by random computer selection from the pool of individuals who had the necessary qualifications. It had taken the human race several thousand years to realise that there were some jobs that should never be given to the people who volunteered for them, especially if they showed too much enthusiasm. As one shrewd political commentator had remarked, we want a president who has to be carried screaming and kicking into the White House, but will then do the best job he possibly can so that it will get time off for good behaviour. And Duncan sees a butterfly and goes to chase after him. And we get, um... Uh, that iridescent creature, drifting so effortlessly through the air, made him forget the ferocious gravitational field of which he was now a captive. He started to run towards it with the inevitable result. Luckily, he landed on a clean patch of grass. He forgot the advice. Oh, and the Titanic gets, like, tugged to New York. Um, and it's weird because this the time I'm filming is just when we've had the Titanic, uh, the Titan submarine um, exploded beneath the water killing everybody on board um, but the way Clark writes about it as well um, obviously he was writing this before the wreck of the Titanic was found so he didn't know exactly what, what we were dealing with down there but he's talking about how you know in about 150, 200 odd years, the Titanic's floated back up to the surface, but actually I've read about it. I reckon within the next 50 years, there's not gonna be much left of the wreck of the Titanic because the pressure underneath the water is just so immense that it's just, you know, fucking shit up. So um, Duncan goes to this party and basically people have these like name tags with buzzers on. And if you wanna to speak to someone, you can buzz their name tag, um, which sounds horrible. But yeah, I like this. I wanted to read these out. Um, he was quite content to be a passive observer, and 90% of the conversations he overheard were meaningless or boring, but not all. And then I enjoy um, these examples. I loathe parties like this, don't you? It's supposed to be the only set of genuine antique inflatable furniture in the world. Of course, they won't let you sit on it. Buying at 150 and selling at 180, would you believe the grown men once spent their entire lives doing that sort of thing? Bill's ambition is to be shot dead at the age of 200 by a jealous wife. How's the revolution going? If you need any more money from the Ways and Means Committee, let me know. 
Food should come in pills the way God intended. Anyone in the room she's not slept with? Well, maybe that statue of Zeus. I'm getting up a petition to save the lunar wilderness areas. I thought it was the Van Allen belt. Oh, that was last year. I do like the idea of food pills. I even have a poem called Food Pills in my uh, collection. I like this little line as well because it's true. This world was indeed misnamed. It should have been called Ocean, not Earth. It should. That is very true, very accurate. I thought this was a cool little paragraph here that talks about, I guess, artificially generated voices. It was a friendly, powerful voice, very deep and resonant. Yeah, there was something slightly unnatural about it. A computer? Duncan asked himself. That was too easy an assumption. In any case, there was no way of distinguishing between computer vocalisation and human speech, especially now that a realistic number of errs, wells, incomplete sentences and downright grammatical errors could be incorporated to make the non-electronic participants in a conversation feel at ease. He guessed that he was listening to a man talking through a speech disguising circuit. I don't know why I said speech weirdly there. Great little line here. He had never realised before that shared grief could be an aphrodisiac. And this interesting paragraph here kind of takes a look at how we would feel in the in a future where we've progressed so much, you know. I do not believe that we have come to the end of history, and that what lies ahead is only an elaboration and an extension of our present powers on planets already discovered. Yet it cannot be denied that this feeling is now widespread, and makes itself apparent in many ways. There is an unhealthy preoccupation with the past, and an attempt to reconstruct or relive it. Not, I hasten to add, that this is always bad. What we, would do, what we are doing now proves that it is not. And then just one final bit I want to read out here. Of course, one could always take refuge in the cold mathematics of reproduction. Old Mother Nature had not the slightest regard for human ethics or feelings. In the course of a lifetime, every man generated enough spermatozoa to populate the entire solar system many times over, and all but two or three of that potential multitude were doomed. Had anyone ever gone mad by visualising each ejaculation as a hundred million murders? Quite possibly. No wonder that the adherents of some old religions had refused to look through the microscope. Mm. But yeah, obviously, that's the issue, isn't it, with um, people trying to limit abortion. You know, people are happy to limit uh, female reproductive rights, but they're not happy to limit male reproductive rights, even though every, every cum shot is 100 million murders. Anyway, Imperial Earth by Arthur C. Clarke, 3.5 out of 5, did enjoy. Some really strong stuff here. It's one of those where the plot isn't necessarily as important as the ideas that it raises, and I think that's what makes really good science fiction in general. Um, there is some decent plotting and decent uh, characterization, but really it's like some of the philosophical bits and then the differences between living on Titan and living on Earth, like the idea of not being able to run when you, when you go to Earth because your muscles aren't used to it and stuff. I thought that was all really cool. So yes, Imperial Earth by Arthur C. Clarke. So there we have it, that's what I made of Imperial Earth by Arthur C. Clarke. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.